Okay. Uh, I'm Anthony Cox. Uh, like I said, uh, I've been New River Training Center about 10 years. I've been weatherization going on 22 now. So I uh, was a little thinner, had a little more hair, you know, but, uh, you know, I got a passion for this stuff, you know, enjoyed working with the clients and going out and seeing the difference we can make in some of these homes. And, and my experience, you know, started on the crew, you know, wrapping water heaters, insulating attics, and then we got into doing uh, zonal pressures and CAS testing and that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, we'll be using a PowerPoint and some house of pressure here that we developed and uh, to kind of demonstrate some of the things that we're talking about as well. But uh, the last 10 years, I've been pretty much doing, you know, full-time uh, training in the, so. Um, so my name is Phil Hall. Um, I work at, with Anthony at the New River Center for Energy Research and Training, NSERT. Um, moved up there in 2010, uh, been in this industry for about six years now, building science weatherization industry. So um, we're basically just going to go into more, you know, advanced uh, shell diagnostics, you know, uh, touch on a little bit of zonals, but first just kind of look at what the building shell is supposed to look like, you know, so um, let's just get started. So the thermal and air barrier or pressure boundary, how many people know what the thermal and pressure boundaries are? Okay, what is the thermal and pressure boundary? Somebody. It's the envelope, okay. It separates conditioned space from Unconditioned space, right? Okay. I like to ask a lot of questions. I don't like to just be the only trainer in the room. I, you know, I think we're all kind of experienced in some ways and we can feed off of each other. So please feel free to speak up and holler at me and, and, and also a ask any questions at any time. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, the thermal and the pressure boundary, uh, they're that line that, you know, maybe imaginary line at times that separates conditioned air from unconditioned air. So it's what encloses the living space of our house, okay? Um, and what's really unique about the thermal and pressure boundaries is that they need to be what? Touching. Touching. They need to be in contact with one another, okay? You know, think about it like, uh, I like to describe it as our clothes are our thermal boundary to our skin, okay? If we hold our jacket away from us outside, are we going to be warm? No, we want to tighten it up, right? We pull our jacket in tight, we pull everything against our skin as much as we can. So the insulation, the thermal boundary, needs to be in contact with the pressure boundary. Okay, so is this an aligned thermal and pressure boundary? Okay, I didn't hear you. Is this an aligned thermal and pressure boundary? Okay, thank you. No, it's not, okay? And this is what happens a lot of times when we have new technologies. In this case, this is a floor truss system. This is new construction. It's a little bit different than what you're used to seeing, but this happens even on uh, existing homes. Sometimes the insulation will fall down a little bit or it's installed down at the bottom of the floor joist. It's not touching the floor. It's not touching the pressure boundary. Is it doing it any good? No. It's basically like having your jacket sit right here on the table. There's my jacket. I'm standing outside. I'm not going to be warm, right? Okay, so looking at another little diagram of, of thermal and pressure boundary, are both of them complete? No. no? Why not? We got a hole in the thermal boundary. What's that hole representing? Attic Probably an attic excess, very common. So we could have completely good insulation throughout the entire attic and we leave the attic access uninsulated. Where's all the heat going to go? Up through that attic access, just like a little chimney, basically. It's the weakest spot in the thermal and pressure boundary. We have a good air barrier, but no insulation. There we go. Here's an example of that. This, this is a little confusing to me because they installed 16-inch bats in 24-inch bays. They offset them. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you get points for that. <laughs> so, basic math, okay? 16 inches is smaller than 24. Doesn't work. Has to go completely side to side, all the way end to end, all right? 
And it, it seems pretty basic for all of us in here because we've, we've seen common mistakes like that, you know. But uh, it's easy to make some, some of these mistakes. Is this a complete thermal and pressure boundary? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> Look hard. Well, technically. Technically, okay? So, yes, no. How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people say technically? <laughs> okay, so... Um, <clears throat> If we look at these two boxes independently, then yes, we have a complete pressure boundary, but we don't have insulation here. We have it here. What this signifies a lot of times is something that looks like this. A chase behind a chimney, a plumbing wall or something that somebody has taken and laid a bat over the hole, but there's no barrier at the top. So what's going to happen? What will that uh, insulation look like a lot of times? It's going to be dirty or black. Dirty or sooty looking, yeah. right. And, and so basically, it's also kind of a fall hazard. You know, if I'm up there in the attic and I don't take note of maybe that there's potentially a chase somewhere in the attic that I'm looking for, whoop, yeah. it's like a tiger pit. Uh, <laughs> what's another term for that? Those uh, chases, we'll call them bypasses, right? Bypasses. So it's, you know, it's allowing the air and the heat and the, and the moisture as well to escape from the house, you know, into the attic. And as the air heats up in the house, you know, the warm air is going to want to escape out the top of the building, you know. So uh, even though there's insulation there, it's not a good air barrier. I'm going back one, actually. Okay. So, so yeah, just look, looking at this same chase idea, even if this was completely sealed and these are two separate boxes, what are they connected to? We've just connected the attic to what? Potentially the crawl space or the outside. And what's in the crawl space besides your cat? Unconditioned air. Unconditioned air. Dirt. Moisture. 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 Yeah, the, one of the biggest things that we really worry about in the crawl space. And what's going to happen if that moisture migrates through this chase and ends up up here? It could condense, rain down on top of your ceiling. Hey, I got a roof leak. Right? Call the roofer out. He'll sell you a new roof. No problem. But yeah, so you can have problems that start from somewhere else in the house, migrate, and end up, you know, in another part of the house. So we have two different kinds of leakage that we're really kind of looking for when we're looking at the, the building envelope, the thermal and pressure boundary. We have this direct leakage. This is easy. You know, we've got a hole directly to the outside. We can see it. And then we have what we call indirect leakage not so easy to find sometimes because the path is different. It's not directly to the outside. It's coming in from somewhere else, migrating through an unconditioned space or an interstitial space. And then this is where we feel the air coming out down here at the outlet. But is that where the air is coming from? If it's maybe connected to an exterior wall, maybe. But if this is an interior wall, it's coming from down the top plate, wire penetration, plumbing penetration, where is it coming from? Through the soffit or, you know, venting? So, how do we find these leaks? We use a blower door. Um, so what does a blower door do? It pulls air out of the house or you pressurize the house. Why? Find leaks. Basically, we're pulling air out of the house and air is coming back in through those leaks, right? That we're looking for. And so then we can walk around with our hands or smoke pencil or thermal camera and we can find those leaks, okay? Blower door also kind of helps us determine how big is the collective leak, right? In some cases it's big enough for a man to crawl through. So um, you talked about that's like approximate leakage area. Yeah. So, you know, you go to Mrs. Jones's house, you say, well, Mrs. Jones, your blower door is 4,000 CFM at 50 pascals. What's that mean to Mrs. Jones? Nothing. Not a thing, right? But if you could tell Mrs. Jones, if I took all the holes in your house and I put them in one spot, how big the hole would be, you know, that might be useful. So, you know, it's not a perfect way, but a, a, what they call approximate leakage area. You could take your blower door, divide it by 10, or knock off the last digit, uh, 5,000. You, if you divided that by 10 or took off the last digit, it would give you 500, right? Or 500. Well, if it was 4,000, like I mentioned. 
It'd be 400, right? It'd be 400 square inches. And I've done this a little bit, just playing around with training. Like if we had a window, it was open, it was like 30 inches wide, and I opened it like, you know, uh, an inch or something, it would, you know, like 300, or if I opened it 10 inch, it'd be like 3,000, you know. So 30 times 10 is what? 300. And so if I made a 30 uh, by 10 hole or 300 square inch hole, it would take my blower up by about how much? 10,000, right? So you can kind of, and that works out pretty good, but it's, it will give you an approximate. So, and then you say, well, when we're done with the house, you know, uh, we'd like to cut that, you know, in half, you know, so that gives you a kind of a visual. That's a good visual for the homeowner too, because she may not be able to visualize 500 square inches. It's a, it's a really big number still, but you can divide it by 144, which is 12 by 12, the amount of square inches in one foot, and then basically say, hey, you know, see this sheet of paper? We've got maybe three or four of these is what we're looking for. Or, hey, uh, your entire house is wide open. You got a front door open in yeah, your house somewhere. It's about the size of a window or door. <laughs> about the size of a window or door. And that's open how long? Year round. Oh, year right. round. Yeah. Yep. So, so then we use these other things <clears throat> that we'll talk about to help find where are the holes, because it's not all in one hole. So we have to find holes. Exactly. So, is it easy to see the holes in this picture? You see the holes? No. Why not? It's too much junk there. Huh? Too much junk? Yeah, a lot of junk in this picture. Insulation, dead raccoons, you know, boards, boxes of Christmas yeah. decorations, you know, whatever. It's in the way, so it can be really difficult to say, okay, we're going to find the leaks in, in this situation unless we're going to take everything out, which can be costly and time consuming as well. So, <clears throat> you know, the blower door helps us find the leaks if we know where to look, if it's easy. But sometimes it's not so easy to find out where the leak is, where the air is coming from. I mean, we can feel it at the wall here, but what's its path? You know, what's it traveling through? And so that's why we use what we call zonal pressure diagnostics or testing to find out and pinpoint where those leaks are so that we're not digging through six inches of whatever that was installed 60, 70, 100 years ago, you know, and trying to find small, tiny leaks where we could use another tool, another way to pinpoint and verify where that air is coming from. We can get there a lot quicker. We can save a little bit of time, save a little bit of money, you know. So let's talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> so why we perform zonal pressure diagnostics, it directs our work scope, okay? It pinpoints, it tells us where to go. Confirms that my thermal and pressure boundary are aligned. I have a complete air barrier. We can look across the, the attic and yeah, it looks like we've got lots of insulation, but is the air barrier beneath it complete? And it's hard to see with all that junk in the way, okay? Or even with good insulation, it's hard to see unless you dig through it, you know. <clears throat> Help us find the big holes first. You know, we don't want to spend hours tracking down two CFM of leakage reduction, do we? We want to get in there and we want to knock out several hundred to a couple thousand, get in and get out. You know, that's the key. You know, get our numbers down quickly, fast. Verify that the work is finished, you know. Test in and test out. Testing out is very important. Testing as you work is important, you know. We just sealed what we thought was a big hole. What did it do to my number? Sometimes the big holes that we see are really not that leaky because they're not connected to the inside of the house. They may be a gigantic shaft that goes right through the center of the house from the attic to the crawl. We do need to seal it for other issues such as health and safety and moisture and etc. But we may not have knocked off anything off the blower door number. So that's a good way to kind of verify that we're working in the right direction too. And you know basically to make sure that we're doing it cost effectively, you know. So we're not just sealing holes that, that don't do anything. And then health and safety and durability, you know. Tracking down them holes that, that are connected to those spaces that we don't want to be breathing from, right? So which would be like the crawl space, the attic, through a dirty wall connected to, I don't know, Pick your poison, you know, but so here's a, a standard house and you can see that, you know, hot air is escaping out the top 
right? And that hot air leaving the top of the building basically pulls in air around all these other little cracks on the inside, right? Where do we want to start sealing typically in a house? In the attic, of course. We want to stop this here, and that's going to slow down these blue arrows. But these are some of the locations where we would do some testing to verify, like this wet wall right here where the plumbing's going through. Is that open to the attic or not? Maybe it's hard to get over there and dig through 12 inches of insulation. You know, we're going to mess up maybe the homeowner's insulation that she just had blown in the year before to go over there and find out, oh, that hole really is sealed. You know, whoops, and, and then go back, you know, back over to the attic hatch. So maybe we could test this wall to find out, well, is that really where we need to start looking? Or do we need to start someplace else in the house? It, uh, it, it varies, but, but it's best to always start at the top and work your way down, because if you seal the bottom first, then you're basically pushing everything up, you know? And some of those holes down in the basement, depending if you've got combustion appliances in the basement, you may need those holes for combustion air. I mean, if you're gonna seal those up, then you wanna check and, you know, the volume of the, the basement and determine do you have other things in place for that appliance to run properly, or if you don't need them, then seal them up, you know? If we go in the basement and we smoke where the plumbing is, because a lot, a lot of times you can see that hole where it's coming out, then if the smoke's going up, then it's leaky. Well, that tells you it's leaky at the bottom because the blower door is in the door at the front of the house it could be pulling up from the bottom and then out, but does that tell you that the, it's leaky from the top? We don't know. And that's one of the things with zonal diagnostics is that it tells us that the wall is leaky. We then have to determine is it the top or the bottom too. So you, you need to look in both locations. Yeah. <clears throat> so what I have here is the blower door is not on. What do I have on in the house that you can see is all these lights and the lights in this little house are making heat. So I use a little smoke puffer, they use all kinds of different ones. This one's called smoke pencil or dragon puffer. And what you're seeing uh, is this house is an interior wall and I'm taking the smoke and if just what you were talking about, if there's leaks like around the plumbing chase or something and I'm in the basement what you're looking at is a top of the wall in the attic. And so uh, it's actually getting pulled up, you know, the wall, you know, and then into the attic. What we'll also do is, this is from the attic. When you're running the blower door and you have a smoke pencil in the attic, you're, if you're, most of the time you depressurize, is that right? Most of you yeah. folks depressurize? So if you're depressurizing, that means you're sucking air out with the blower door, right? And so if I turn the blower door on, for instance, I'll turn it on just a little bit. So now I've got a negative pressure in the house. My blower door's on, right? So, and I've, I've still got this leak into the attic and it may want to pull the air down uh, into the house. Let's see if it'll do that. See if I can get a little smoke going on here. But it's actually going down in now because the house is, the fan's sucking air out, right? And anywhere there's holes to the house, it's gonna do what? To the outside, I mean. It's gonna bring air in. So if you're in the attic, you know, if you trust your buddy you're with to lock you up in the attic, you know, while you're running the blower door, as long as they let you out, right? Then you can go through the attic with the smoke pencil anywhere you think there's leaks, you know, and check the, you know, with the smoke pencil, and if it's a leak, it's gonna do what? Pull it down. It's gonna pull it down. And what about after the work? What about after the work if I seal it? I got a little clear piece here. I'm going to seal this. Now, what should it do? Just kind of hangs there. Sometimes I'll use a set of little puffer. It works a little better sometimes. But I like both of them. But you guys that are up close can probably see. Is it going down the wall now? Up, you guys up close? So did we do a good job sealing that? I didn't caulk it or foam it, but you know, it's way better than what it was. So you can use that to visual stuff. But what we'll talk about next is like zonal pressures. And any of you use infrared with the blower doors on? So if it's winter time 
and it's cold outdoors and I have my infrared on and my blower door's on, uh, actually what I'll do is I'll run the infrared camera before I turn the blower door on, just kind of get a baseline. And so I may, and, I, and that includes the interior walls and stuff too. But once I turn the blower door on, uh, this wall may have looked kind of like bright or white to begin with. If it's in the winter time, and this is the top of this wall is open, and the attic's cold, and the blower door starts pulling air down the wall, what's going to happen to the color of the wall when you look at it with the infrared? It'll, if you're looking at it with black and white, you know it'll turn a darker color, won't it? Yeah. So you can kind of use that, you know, with your blower door on. And you can just leave your blower door on. Once you got your blower door reading, you can just keep it at about 30 pascals or so, just enough to keep the pressure difference. And walk around with that infrared. And if there's leaks, you know, up into the attic, you know, it'll it'll be pulling the air down. So you can use uh, visual stuff, right? If we said if there was insulation over top of that hole, what would it look like? Probably dirty or sooty looking, right? If it was a hole down into the house. If you use a smoke smoke puffer and you're depressurizing the house it would suck it down in. What if we were pressurizing the house, what would it do? Anybody ever do that? Anybody ever take an infrared in the attic and pressurize the house? How's that, does that work? I see a few hands. So uh, if you pressurize and the house is warm and you're in the attic with the infrared, what would you see? You'd see brighter hot spots, right? Yeah, I've heard of people that, that would air seal, depends on your climate and stuff, they would air seal the attic and if you miss the top plates, especially in a colder climate, top plates, the gap at the top plates, and it's not a very big gap, is it? But if you add it up over the whole attic space, especially when you're in a more extreme climate, then uh, that makes a big difference. But I know, I haven't done this myself, but when they pressurize the house, and then the top plates, it looked like train tracks, you know, through the insulation with the infrared. So, so you can use your visual for looking for dirty insulation. You can uh, use your smoke puffer. You can use... Uh, infrared uh, and then we'll talk about zonal pressure so let's we'll turn this off and then I'll give it back to Phil okay so going back to the to just kind of re reaffirm that this wall could have a hole at the top or the bottom I mean sure sealing the one at the bottom might be the easiest one to get to but we could still be leaking hot air through this wall and then out the top. So that's why we always want to seal at the top first because we want to stop that movement of heat going through the top of our building, okay? Take that pressure plane, as we call it, and push it farther down in the building. That restricts the amount of air that's going to come into the bottom holes, all right? <clears throat> so zonal pressure diagnostics is simply a method of testing and comparing the pressures from one zone to another zone. Okay, and those zones, um, you know, could be like attics, uh, crawl spaces, interior walls. We're comparing those spaces to where we're standing. How does, how does that compare? And we'll go into that here in a little bit. Um, so, but that's really the, the kind of a brief definition of what a zonal pressure diagnostics is. Um, so, what do we need to, to do a zonal test? Blower door. <clears throat> Maybe an extra manometer and an extra hose or two, you know. And a long hose or a short hose, depends on, you know, where you're testing and what you're testing. Um, where are we going to be testing? You know, some primary zones that we always want to test is the crawl space. Is it connected to the house? Do we want it connected to the house, typically? No, not really. Um, the attic, do we want it connected to the house? No. In, in, in uh, specific cases, like closed crawl spaces, yeah. that's different. Yeah, in that case, then, then you will be bringing the, the crawl space into maybe conditioned space or closer to conditioned space because you've moved the thermal and pressure boundary from the floor location all the way to the walls. That's a very specific application, and in that case, it's okay. Yes, <clears throat> because you're going to be conditioning or controlling the moisture in that right. space at that point. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. But, that, but that's now a controlled environment. That's what you call yeah. it? Yeah. It's controlled because you're controlling the humidity, okay. either through conditioning that space or using a dehumidifier and pulling the humidity out or whatever. But it's not like uh, an attic or a typical vented crawl space that does its own thing year-round. 
We've now controlled it in some way. We've, we've applied a barrier, a really tight barrier. We've applied insulation in a different manner. And we're going to maybe, in a lot of cases, add ventilation to that space or something that's controlled. So, yeah, a controlled environment. <clears throat> Basements are another area that we would do zonal diagnostics to, to determine is that basement supposed to be in my thermal and pressure boundary or outside of? Not visually what's it look like, because that can deceive us at times, but is it really supposed to be connected to the upstairs where I'm sitting and watching TV, the rest of the conditioned space, or is it supposed to be outside of that envelope? And a lot of times that's hard to determine because there may not be insulation in the floor at all because they just left it out or whatever. So <clears throat> we may need to determine, are we going to bring that basement into the house or are we going to leave it outside the house? And, and that's kind of a conversation that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more here, but you may want to have that conversation with the homeowner. How are they using that space? You know? um, so garages, another area that we would test. These are large areas you know, on, on this first slide. Do we want the garage inside the house or outside the house? Outside, yeah, you don't want to park the, the car in the living room. You know, attached porches, you know, that roof space. Do we want it inside the house or outside? Outside, of course. Unless they, they've got a screened-in porch area enclosed or something and they're heating that space, but typically that's going to be an outside space. So, all right, so we've got some secondary zones like interior walls, cantilevers. What's a cantilever? Like bay windows, that's a good example. Bump out, it's like, it basically sticks out, like the second floor might stick out farther than the first floor, you know. Um, drop soffits, you know, those are like those uh, bump outs or uh, bulkheads or whatever, like uh, above your kitchen cabinets. Um, depending on where you are in the country, they call them something different. Um, porch ceilings, cavities between floors. So this just shows the difference between inside zones and outside zones, heated versus unheated spaces. You know, heated spaces we want to be sealed and separated from unheated spaces, basically. Uh, the primary zone, the big difference between the primary and the secondary zones is most of the time the primary zone, you're going to have a door that you can open from that zone, generally to the house, sometimes also to the outside, to be able to find out if I've got 2, 000, uh, a 3,000 CFM house, how much of that 3,000 is coming from the garage or how much is coming from the attic. But the big thing, like what you were saying here, we're Initially, we want to know if things are more inside or more what? Outside. So that's the big thing. And then you can, you know, go a little deeper on the CFM thing. But that's a kind of a difference between the primary and the secondaries. Okay. Okay. So, doing the uh, zonal pressure diagnostics, we need blower doors we talked about. Typically, most people depressurize. Um, that's probably the, the easiest, but you know, if you can, you can do pressurization too. Um, and we're gonna, once we've got the blower door set up and, and we've got the pressure between the house and the outside to 50, then we're gonna use a separate manometer or we could use the same manometer if we only have one and just detach it from the, uh, from the door here. Most of them have two channels. This has an A and a B. And what do you see right here where my finger is? Right, what does it say? Input. And what's this one down here say? Reference. So this is like one zone or one area with reference to another. All right? So you have an A and a B. So really it's like having what? Two manometers, right? So you measure one space with reference to another. When you do the blower door, what do you typically measure? You usually put it on channel A. What do you do with the top port? It stays open, right? Where, what about the bottom port? It's usually a hose that goes to the outside, right? And if you were talking to somebody, you know, what the, kind of what they call manometer law or manometer language maybe, is you would say house with reference to what? Outside, outside right? And then over here, if I'm just talking blower door, what am I going to put on here? A hose that goes to where? One goes here and then one goes to my blower door fan, right? And typically, when I'm depressurizing, do I do anything to this hose? It stays open, right? So it's, it, and it's fan pressure with reference to the, or fan location is the way that they would say it. Uh, 
And uh, so this side you would get to your 50. This side over here you would set it up to read your CFM. All right. Let's switch over to the RetroTech. So the RetroTech, where are the port connections at? In the back, right? Input on B. Um, okay, so that's your door. Reference on channel A. So this is going to be your reference. In, in this case, there's is typically a red hose, but it's going to, reference is going to go where? Outside. And the input uh, on channel A was open. So basically, you know, this is channel A. The yellow and green are uh, channel B. And if you notice right there, it says that the yellow right here, if you sit real little, what's that say in parentheses? That goes to the fan, right? So it's similar. They both have two pressure channels, and then they'll read on the gauge here. Just real quickly, though, if I measure the pressure for you guys who have been doing this for a while, if I stuck the hose in the attic and it read 45 attic with reference to the house, what do you think it would read attic with reference to the outside if my blower door was at 50? It would read 5. Some folks put the hose on the bottom versus the top. What would happen if, you know, let's say it read 50 here and I put the hose on the bottom, didn't change anything else. It would read a negative 50. But when we're doing pressure pans and zonals, we're talking more absolute numbers. We're not so much worried about the negative or positive number. We're just looking at that, what we call absolute. If I'm doing a cast pressure or a draft test on a water heater, is that important to know if it's positive or negative? Then that means a lot more difference where that hose goes. But in, in zonals and pressure pans, it's not that big a deal because you're, you're learning, you're doing absolute pressures, all right? So let's leave it at that. So this is like a, uh, a two-story house. Uh, you know, this could be a basement or whatever. Sometimes I'll talk about this as a crawl space if you're in an area that doesn't have a lot of crawl spaces. I mean, a lot of basements. Probably don't have a lot of basements here in New Orleans. <laughs> or they call swimming pools, right? Yeah. <laughs> So here I have like a, a tuck under garage. It could be an attached garage on the side if it's a single story. And what did Phil, when he asked the question, what did you guys say? That would I want that the garage to be part of the house or, or, or more outdoors? Outside, because if we do some testing and find out that it's inside, even though my car is physically parked in the garage, it's acting like what? That it's in the living room, right? Yeah, anything that's in the garage is now where? In the house, right, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, anything that's in there, paint, gasoline, lawnmower, you know, all that stuff can be connected. And we can do tests to find out how connected. All right, we've got basement over here. We've got ductwork. We can open these ductworks up. Is your ductwork part of the pressure and thermal boundary? If your ductwork runs, what if your ductwork runs in the attic? Is that part of your pressure and thermal boundary? It is. Is, is, that, is that moving the indoor air through that duct? Yeah. yeah. So, so you'd want that sealed and what? Insulated, right? You know, if it's in an attic or an unconditioned space. So, so if this is, you know, let's say this is an unconditioned crawl space or whatever, and that duct is open like that, would that affect my blow door? Because yeah. my duct work is what? It's connected to the interior of the space, right? Yeah. So we can seal that up, and I have leaks on the supplies and on the returns, and uh, we can close those back up. Uh, up here we have, this is more like a bathroom. Uh, we have a, a, a fan. It's probably not showing up in the video or there, but there's a fan over here. Uh, this is like the bathroom. There's bypasses we can open at the top and the bottom here. Uh, there's also... Uh, interior doors that we can open and close here. When you do the blower door test, are those interior doors open or closed? Yeah, the interior doors are open, yeah. Okay. So, and then the same thing over here, I got more bypasses, another door. At the top, we got a bypass. This right here is like an attic access, and we'll open those. And there's a fireplace and a water heater that we can use for testing and stuff too. But all these tests right now are done with what on? The zonal test and pressure pans are done with what on? The blower door on, right? What about my furnace and my water heater? They're off, right? Yeah. What about the fireplace damper? Yeah. How about those suspicious ceilings he was talking about? Anybody saw that earlier? I got this ceiling. You think it's a good idea to look up in there before you run the blower door? Anybody pull one down on their head yet? I saw a hand over there. 
How many times have you done it, have you done it since? <laughs> Just for fun, you know. How many people have got their hose caught in their blower fan? Okay. How many people have done it twice? <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> and it's usually during the training, too. <laughs> okay, now. So, what I've got in the house here, I've got a manometer set in here. And I've got the, the green hose. It's going to the outside. The top port on channel A is open. I'm going to switch to a simulator. You can see this a little bit better. So that's going to be, when I turn my blower on, I want to get channel A to what? How much Pascal? 50, right? And then on the other side, I'm going to have another hose that I can put either inside or outside or the garage or wherever. So, this is mine. And then I'm going to turn the blower up to 50. I've got all my exterior windows and doors closed and, and so on. So, I'm going to turn that up to 50. Pretty tight house. Get it to 50. All right, now. That's close enough. All right, so if y'all can see my pointer down here at the bottom, that's where my green hose is going to the outside. That's my 50. This other hose, uh, there's nothing on the bottom port. The top port has this yellow hose on it. Just by looking at this gauge, you know, we can tell we're at 50. We know that that green hose, the other end of the green hose is connected to the bottom's going where? Outside. outside. What about this yellow hose? You see it's connected to the input on channel A. Where do you think the other end of it is? Inside or outside? Inside. inside. It's just laying uh, right in the, in the living room floor. And so basically, the top port uh, that has a yellow hose, the, it, the end of that was in the same place as the bottom port, right? So there's no pressure difference. Is that, everybody good with that? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that yellow hose, and I know you guys, some of you can't see it, I'm going to take the yellow hose that's on the input. I'm just going to stick it outside, and then I'm going to put the window back on. What's going to happen to the reading? What should it read? They both read 50, right? Because Now, there is a little bit of difference. You notice the one on the A says a negative, and one on the right shows a positive, but that's because I've got my hose on the top versus the bottom. A lot of times, I just leave my hose on the top because you know, I have my fan pressure hose on the top, I do my pressure pans on the top. That's just preference. I can move it to the bottom and it would say minus 50. But the 50 on that V side tells me what? Where's the, that space where the other end of that yellow hose is, is where? Outside, right? So what about the uh, attic? How would I do a, a zonal test in the attic? What would I do? So I take this yellow hose, put it in the attic? Yeah, and what's, a, how do you guys normally do that? You put it, sometimes you might drill a hole. Anybody ever put a hose in the attic before you run the blower door and then, then close a hatch on it? You know, so you got one hanging down. So sometimes you can do that. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this out and put it in the attic right here. It's going to stick up in the attic. My house is at 50, you know, thereabouts. My attic's pretty close to 52. What does that tell me about my attic? That it's basically all the way outside, right? So, when I open that attic access, what do you think is going to happen to the attic pressure? It's going to drop. Now, my house is at 50. I made a leakage. I made one big leak in the attic. Looking at that number right now, what, you, what can you tell me about the attic on that B side reading? 25, is that inside or outside? It's about half and half, isn't it? You know, and, uh, and, and this is something we'll expand on in the second half of the, the next session, but if I have 25, is 25, what, half of 50? What that's telling me, you know, if you talk about what they call pressure leakage ratio, is that the air leak between the house and the attic, the size of the hole, guess how that compares to the size hole between the attic and the outdoors? 
Is it bigger, smaller, or the same? It would be the same, wouldn't it? And uh, let's go. Let's close this out of catch down. As I close the at now, like I said, this is all one big hole. But in the real world, you saw Phil's picture, right? Where are all those holes at? They're everywhere, right? So I'm just simulating this being in one spot so it's easy to visualize. If I start sealing this attic, what's going to happen? Uh, first, of course, my 50 is going to go up because it's going to make my house tighter, right? So I have to readjust my blower door. But we were at uh, uh, about 25. But once I close that attic access some and readjust my blower door to 50, what's going to happen to the 25 if I start air sealing? It should go up. If I made the hole bigger, what do you think it would do? It would go down. Okay, so it's about 50, and now the attic is its a lot more outside, right? It's not perfectly outside, and, but it's almost all the way outside. And, 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 and we'll look at this chart again in the second part, but basically that tells me that the hole is one-eighth. The hole between the house and the attic is one-eighth of the hole between the attic and the outdoors. And we'll, we'll talk about that and go some examples. But that's usually not too bad. I mean, if I have a little, not a whole lot of attic venting, you know, if I've got maybe this much attic venting, uh, you know, maybe less than 100 square inches, you know, an eighth, an eighth of that's not too big. But let's say I have huge amounts of venting. Would an eighth of that be a whole lot? Yeah, so sometimes a 48 could not be, you know, a perfect number, you know, or a good enough number, you know, if you have a lot of attic venting. All right, so now, let's just skip from the attic. See what time we got here. I don't want to get too... Okay. All right, so I need to move along. But, okay, so that was just some examples with an attic, okay? What if I wanted to measure the pressure in the garage? What would I do? Take that same hose I had in the attic and do what? Move it to the garage, it to the garage right? What kind of a number am I looking for in the garage? I'm looking for close to 50, right? I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna, all I'm doing is physically moving that hose from the attic to the garage. Right now it's about 30 something. So it's, you know, it's a little more to the outside than it is to the inside. I've got a little bypass at the bottom of this interior wall. I've got an interior wall right here. I'm gonna open the bottom of that wall. What's gonna to happen to that 32, you think? If I open the bottom of this wall, it's going to connect this interior wall to the garage, and the interior wall is connected to the house. What do you think will happen to the 32? How many of you say it'll go down? How many say it'll go up? How many say it's technically correct? <laughs> I had to use that. I like that, Phil. So let's open it. Let's see what happens. So we open it up. So I open it up and went down. My ductwork is in the garage, okay? I got some ductwork in the garage. If I make a leak in the ductwork, what will that do? You think it'll go down? What did we say about the ductwork? It circulates what kind of air? Hopefully indoor air, right? And so if I make it, and I'm going to take the window off. That'll change things for a second, but I'm going to put the window back on. What did that do? Now where's my, my car, right? In my Super B. Where's that at? In the living room. It's in the living room, right? So even though it's physically here, it's connected to the living room. And then, okay, while we're in the garage real quick, we're depressurizing the house, right? And we're, we've, if we've got the garage, we've got the door between the garage and the house open or closed at this point. It's closed. So you know how I was talking about going in the attic with the smoke puffer with the blower on? Could you do that in the garage? So you could go in the garage, you puff the smoke and see where the air's coming. You know, you got the, the door itself, you got like uh, your light switch boxes, you know, all kinds of penetrations between that garage wall uh, and the house. So if you're on the positive pressure side, in other words, it's negative inside the house, so it's depressurizing, and that means that the air outdoors is going in. I could go in the garage, I don't have my little camera down here, but y'all saw how it worked upstairs. If I puff smoke in the garage, what would it do to that open wall? Where would it go it would go up into the house right and as I air seal these things then that pressure that three is going to go more toward what outside right now I'm probably still about to the 32 that I had 
But if I went through and air sealed every crack and gap between the garage and the house, would that make that number go which way then? It would make it go more toward 50. So there's still some connection. None of these joints are sealed. The duct work that goes through the floor is not sealed. So the key is that we're not really worried about negatives and positives. We're worried about absolute numbers, 0 to 50, okay? The negative and positive is simply going to depend on where you put your hose on the manometer. So there's just a sample house. There's no air barrier or thermal barrier drawn on this house. You know, where, where's it supposed to be? You know, it could be in a number of different locations. It could be here, you know, down. It could go up and over. It just depends on how this house is being used. And what we're trying to do is verify that where the insulation is located, that that actually is the tighter air barrier. Is that, is that where we need to be fixing, or do we need to maybe move the insulation to another location, you know, where, the, where the, technically the air barrier actually is, you know? So sometimes our eyes can fool us. That's why we like to use these pressure diagnostics to kind of verify that, you know, this really is what's happening here. This is what's supposed to be going on here, you know? Um, and here's, a, you know, the test going into the attic. So what number should we see here? 50 if it's tight, right? And don't worry about it being negative or positive. It just depends on where you put that hose. Okay, here's a sample of doing a test to the attic. <clears throat> Basements are the inside or outside. It depends on what? Are we conditioning it directly? You know, not indirectly, not like, well, we got some boxes down there and somebody thought, well, I'm just going to chop a hole here in the side of the duct, you know. No, that's kind of like an afterthought. Um, you know, we don't really need to be conditioning junk. If there's like a living space down there, you know, couch, futon, whatever, somebody's living there, then, then maybe we need to do that. <clears throat> if the system's sized appropriately and it's, you know, accounted for that space, yes. But if it's supposed to be inside, what should be my zonal pressure across this plane right here? Zero, zero right? Zero. Exactly. Right, because that's inside. In this case, on the right, 50. Yep. Okay, so <clears throat> this could be a garage. It could be a basement. This is how we would do the zonal pressure test across this door. We would just slide the hose underneath, you know, or open a door, throw the hose in there, and then close it over top of the, the hose. Uh, you don't want to pinch the hose, so if the door closes really tight and you don't have that little gap at the bottom like you see here, then you may want to use like a little metal tube. You know, sometimes you have like a, a two-inch gap, you know, underneath the door or something. Uh, what I like to do is maybe take like an old towel or something and just kind of try to close off as much of that space as possible. It's still not going to be really accurate unless you tape every part of that. But it's going to give you a good estimate right. of Right, yeah, you're trying to, like I said, get the hose in there. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, in real world, that's the way it's operating right now. Right. But you know that that's one of the leaks right. because that's the gap. And you know you're probably going to, you know, maybe weather strip that or whatever or seal it. But, but you can, okay, let's see how much difference. You could temper, sometimes we'll use like this duck mask, you know, it's like this temporary tape or uh, oh, they got all kinds of different brands of that, but you can just, Temporarily, I've even just taped the whole door jam or whatever just to kind of see what happens. But yeah, you want to try to get the probe in there. Sometimes it'll kind of curl around on you and come back, you know, if you're not careful. But. And, and, and that's a good point that, that you brought up because um, sometimes, has anybody run across a door that's perfectly weather stripped, but the door is just kind of like crooked or warped? You know? Yeah. I mean, so sometimes you, you can do a zonal to like say the garage or the basement and you know be like wow that basement or that garage is really connected to the interior space but you could just push on the door and just realign it to the weather stripping and you watch that zonal number go up it's like oh well here's most of my problem right here that, so that kind of verifies that it's mostly the door but you can also do that and take the door out of the equation and say okay how much more beyond the door do we have, you know, as far as the problem, you know, how many more holes are we going to be looking for? How much of a hole are we looking for? You know, so um, that's a good point. You could just kind of take the door out of the equation because we see that that's a known hole and then see, well, what's beyond that? So, um, so when we're testing inside the envelope, we should see zero. If this is a complete thermal and pressure boundary, if there's no holes in the top plate, 
somebody has sealed, you know, where the drywall meets the, the uh, top framing member um, or, you know, the electrical penetrations and plumbing penetrations, they've been sealed, then we should see, you know, zero or close to that. You know, when you get below five or something, you know, you're getting pretty close. You're, you're doing pretty good. You don't really want to be <clears throat> focusing a lot of your attention on really small numbers. You want to be looking for the larger numbers, okay, initially anyways. So what if we get 25 in this wall? It's, it's equal to the inside and the outside. You know, maybe it looks like that at the top, okay? So what's this hole for? <laughs> it's, well, a, it's, a, it's a wire, isn't it? <laughs> it's, 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 it's supposedly electrical, but I don't know too many electricians that use a two-inch hole saw for a half-inch wire. Well, there's a couple. But, <laughs> but probably is because the plumber decided, oops, I drilled in the wrong spot, he moved it over, and the electrician came back and said, hey, free hole, and ran his wire. You know, he's like, that's one less hole I gotta drill. Uh, you know, gain an extra 10 cents. So, what if we see something like this? What, what do you think you're gonna expect at the top, or what do you think you might see? Will it be a bigger hole or a smaller hole? Bigger? Yeah, maybe something like that. Maybe like a marriage wall, you know, on a, multi-family uh, dwelling, you know, where you got two units button up against each other and the top is just completely missing, or a balloon frame wall, you know. Does everybody know what a balloon frame wall is? Yeah? Basically a wall with no top plate, okay? So here we are testing in a kitchen soffit. Or fur down, or, or a bulkhead, bulkhead or, or wherever you're from. Yeah. <laughs> it might be something else. But it's basically over the kitchen cabinet, right? Yep, over the kitchen cabinet. You got another picture. For so that. what, what, yeah. uh, what should we get here when we do a zonal test of this space? What do we want to see? Zero or 50? Zero? 50? 25? <laughs> okay, so, uh, 45 and a half. <laughs> uh, we should see zero. Because close to zero. Yeah, it's not going to be yeah. perfectly zero, but yeah. closer well, to zero. Right? Yeah, close to zero is possible. If we just think of two numbers, you know. But yeah, so because we want that pressure plane, the air barrier, to be up here, not down here, you know. So here's a, a drawing example of that. Uh, if this is basically not sealed right here, what's it connected to? It's connected to the outside. It's connected to the wall cavity, you know, beneath it. You see this right here? So this is basically connected to this interior wall. Has anybody heard a homeowner complain that my dishes are cold? <laughs> you know? Yeah, actually, a friend of mine just bought a house, and his wife's like, come here, come here. You know, feel my plates. I'm like, yeah, frosted mug. <laughs> you know, not good. Not good. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe it's okay. But really should be in the refrigerator, your freezer, not in the cabinet. So we want to... We want to seal it right here. We want to take that bulkhead out of the equation so that the outdoor air goes over top here and not down inside of here against the drywall, against my kitchen cabinets. You know, we don't want that to be the air barrier. Right. Okay. But what I'd say about that is because that's open to the attic and then it's open to the wall, anything that's open or connected to that wall is now also what? Open to the attic. You know, it's like outdoors. So if we want to try to pull, you know, you had that picture early on, indirect leakage, right? It's coming in one place. You might be coming in the attic down the wall over there, but there's an outlet on the wall or whatever. You know, it's come, you feel it coming out there. But it's coming in the top of the wall. It might be coming underneath the house. But if I just seal around the door jam or, or start caulking all the baseboard, is that going to fix it? All we're going to do is chase the leak. You're going to caulk it here, it's going to do what? probably come out somewhere else so what we want to do is a, a seal it where it comes in and like what you were the first class was saying is you want to seal at the top you know first you know and then probably the bottom you know but so you want to attack it where the air is coming in and then and then the hole in the middle does is, is there as much air coming out of it then because you sealed it at the top you 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 fixed that entry point so to speak and that's what you're doing here. There are different ways to do this, but this is probably the, the most common way to fix it. I mean, you could, you could leave that space outside and air seal the top of that 
that wall and then fill that full of insulation. But the most of, you want your, like you said, your air barrier, your insulation to be where? In the same place, right? Now, all this space, instead of being the 32 that we had, what should that space be a lot closer to now? Zero. And how about those dishes in the silverware? They should be a lot warmer, right? And your frosty mug? No more frosty <laughs> mugs. So is it a good idea to seal here? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> another example of that would be like a house that has two different ceiling heights. You know, basically a short knee wall, you know, in the attic. You know, one ceiling height is maybe eight foot and you go into the next room and it's like, hey, the ceiling in here is nine foot. Ah, oh, I need to check something in the attic. You need to make sure that this is sealed right here because otherwise this is just a giant bypass. And uh, I found one of these in a house actually and we had the blower to run and I was looking at the wall with a thermal camera and the entire wall was blue. I mean, the top to bottom. And I was like, wow. Usually you see like some blue streaks, you know, in the winter time when it's cold outside, but the entire wall was blue. I was like, this is just crazy. And then I got to looking at the two ceilings and I was like, oh yeah, they're two different heights and we go up in the attic. And this is just, you know, the insulation goes right to here and it stops because this is the thermal boundary. But the pressure boundary is incomplete because it stops there too. You know, there's a big hole in it. So we had to seal right here all the way across, put blocking in at the top of that wall. Basically put in a top plate at the eight foot level. You know, and then you have another wall from the eight right. foot to and nine. And sometimes foot it's a good idea to put like a foam board or something mm -hmm. on the back of those rigid board uh, here knee walls there. Yep. And sometimes there's no insulation there at yep. all. So you treat know, it, treat it like an e wall. Yeah. Yeah, treat it just like an e wall. So here's an example of what that would look like. You know, we got two different ceiling heights here, <clears throat> and look, you just got gigantic bypasses. You know, it's like it's like having a balloon frame wall right in the center of your house. You know. <clears throat> there we go. You can see the arrows, the heat coming out the top. So let's talk about front porches. We were, we were talking about some basic zonal diagnostics. You know, I'm standing inside condition space. I'm testing in an attic. I'm supposed to get what? 50. I'm inside. I'm testing an interior wall. What's the number I'm looking for? Zero. I go outside. I'm standing on the front porch. I'm outside and I test into a uh, this porch cavity right here. What number am I looking for? <laughs> he's, yeah, about, he's being, he's being <laughs> tricky with you guys. Think about where he, you're standing. Yeah, he's being tricky. He's standing outside the building. Outside the building. I'm outside. I'm on the front porch. There's the front door right here. Grandma, hey, I'm outside. Okay. <laughs> and he put the hose into that porch. The hose into the porch. Yeah, it should be close to zero because it's attic yeah. and the porch ceiling with reference to where in that case? Yeah. Outside. All right. so, uh. so a takeaway would be, think of it like this. Whatever you're testing, whatever zone you're testing, do you want that zone connected to where you're standing or do you want it away from where you're standing? If I'm on the front porch, do I want that roof space to be outside or inside? Outside. So do I want it connected to me or away from me? And if I want it connected to me, what number should I see? Zero. Zero. If I'm standing inside and I run a hose to that porch, what do I want to see? 50, because I want away from me. So you think of it like that. You know, what am I testing? Do I want that space to be connected to me or do I want it to be away from me? Basically, a, a nice solid barrier is a good way to think about zonals. Because sometimes it's easier to test this space here from the outside versus trying to run a hose through a window and then to the porch and then go back inside and read your manometer. You just take the manometer with you, drill a little hole, stick a hose in there. Okay, you know, the blow door's running. You know, I got zero. Good, that means that blow door's not pulling on that space. That's good. There's, there's no connection there, you see. So that's why if you think of it about, is that space connected to me or is it away from me? Then you can take the manometer and move anywhere you want to. You can, you can go in the garage and test from the garage to the house. You can reverse it if it's easier or whatever. You don't have to always be in the same spot. Okay? So you're always zero? You're always zero. You're basically, yeah, you're always zero. Yeah. That's a good way to think about it. I'm a big zero. Thanks, man. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think, the zero. I think okay. we're out of time. All right, let's stop there.